We're professionals here. No, we're professionals. Okay. <clears throat> Four times the charm, just like with World Wars. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host, Bismarck, and today I am joined by Justin. Hello, Justin. Hello. Uh, Justin does not really need an uh, introduction here on the channel. Uh, those that have been following uh, the past couple of months uh, on the videos will have noticed that uh, I have referred to him a couple of times. Uh, he is an expert on Japanese naval and army aviation, and he also has a great interest in U.S. naval aviation in the Pacific theater. And he has also published in this regard. Now today we're going to talk about a topic that uh, both in he and me find very fascinating. That is aircraft protection and uh, all the, uh, the sort of uh, stereotypes that float around the myths and the reality. And we're going to be contrasting these things and kind of give you a complete overview about uh, this topic. We're going to start a little bit of pre-war developments with World War One and then the interwar years. Then we're going to go into a comparison between some of the major actors during World War Two. And finally, we're going to have a specific case study where Justin is going to have a lot of information for us on Japan and why essentially it is, um, as we call it in our notes, the great stereotype um, that really doesn't hold up to too much scrutiny. That stereotype doesn't hold too much to scrutiny. But we'll, we'll go into that as we go along. Um, now, Justin, for, for uh, the pre-war developments, let's say uh, World War I, how, how are things when it comes to aircraft protection at that point in time? Um, well, it's very, of course, it's, uh, rudimentary. Um, so apparently in the First World War, uh, low-flying aircraft, of, of course, proved vulnerable to fire. Um, so there were some attempts to, to kind of put together some, some kind of armor protection for the crew uh, that were engaged, or for aircraft that were engaged in low-level attacks. Um, uh, from the source I read, actually, the earliest form of fuel tank protection was um, actually a uh, Lockheed... Uh, yeah. redesign of the Curtis HS uh, 2L, oh, which is a flying boat yeah. in 1918. Um, so you can see that like actually like theories uh, or like wanting to put armor or, or fuel tank protection in aircraft went way back, you know, all the way to the First World War. Um, but of course, particularly with fuel tank protection, um, there was what they wanted to do or theorized about and what they could actually do, um, you know, with designing actual fuel tanks to protect things. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the the air war really kicks off in World War One in nineteen sixteen with the Battle of Verdun, and from that onwards, there are certain ideas that float around. Like we have to protect the airplane, we have to protect the pilot, um, but the planes initially. Uh, I mean, if we look at the horsepower rate of of those engines, I mean, we're speaking of. Uh, of you know, horsepower rating somewhere between 80 to 200 horsepower throughout World War II. You know, obviously at the end, we're starting to see machines which are relatively powerful for the time. Um, but the performance isn't even there to install kind of that rudimentary armor as we conceptualize it nowadays with these armor plates and so on. Um, I've, I've seen some material apparently that the Germans try to armor certain aspects of the engines of their Gotha bombers. And also they try to protect the pilots from ground fire, especially in, when, once they started uh, going strongly into the kind of Schlachtflieger, the battle uh, flyers. Um, uh, and, and they started thinking about putting small armor plates, four millimeter maximum, beneath the pilots to protect them. Things change, however, in the interwar year. And this is where it gets very interesting because we see the stark divide between what is possible in terms of fighter protection and what is possible for protection in terms of bombers. And uh, especially there um, in, in, in the lat later 30s, I think we see the major developments. Do, do we see anything in the 20s? Do you know anything there? Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, at least from what I've read, it's kind of the 20s were either a slight continuation of stuff in the First World War or they just forego protection altogether yeah. um, from anything I've seen. Yeah, so. it, it really is, I think, also from, from what I've seen, um, th that idea is kind of there that, yeah, maybe we can th start thinking about protection alone, but the performance of most aircraft just doesn't allow it. And we're not just talking about speed and, 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 and top speed and so on, but we'll go into performance later on as, as, as we talk about these issues. Um, what we start seeing then is, is, is sort of in the late 30s is um, a couple of countries, um, the Soviet Union 
and Germany start going into protection for their aircraft. The Soviet Union starts going into protection for their for their fighter planes. The I-15 uh, biplane fighters, the I-16 start getting some rudimentary protection. And actually, I, when I say rudimentary, I, I think I'm taking a little bit away from from what it actually was. It was substantial. It was I think nine millimeters in some places. And, yeah. yeah, nine millimeters at that point in time. And you got to remember that. Uh, we're talking about a time when most aircraft were armed with two to maybe four um, rifle caliber machine guns. So this kind of armor plate would pretty much soak that up um, completely if, if it would get hit with that kind of um, caliber. With the Germans, we don't see any kind of focus on fighters, but we see it on bombers. Um, what, what, do, what do the Germans do at this point in time? Uh, well, from uh, uh, the Junkers 86, uh, was apparently the first German uh, bomber to receive kind of rudimentary protection for its fuel tanks, and that occurred in 1937. And this was followed by the um, uh, the Dornier 17 in 1938. Um, interestingly, um, next came the Japanese Army with uh, the Ki-20, uh, a later model of the Ki-21, uh, because it, obviously they'd been fighting in China, so they tended to burst into flames and the army was noticed this. Um, so they got, they were the next after the Germans to get protection. And this actually occurred before the Americans are British. So again, we, you know, we could start seeing that, that uh, stereotype. But what is interesting there is that the Soviet Union, Germany and uh, Japan are fighting in the late 30s. So the Soviet Union and uh, Germany are sort of engaged in, in the Spanish Civil War whereas the Japanese are engaged in the Sino-Japanese uh, war. And the... Oh, and the, the, actually the Soviets are also engaged with the Chinese at some point. Uh, sorry, with the Japanese. Um, so it's interesting. These countries are the ones that are fighting at this point, and they're also the ones that are starting to implement some kind of armor. Uh, one, one random interesting aside is that the Japanese army actually purchased a few uh, uh, BR-20s, Italian BR-20s, as... Um, an intermediate aircraft before the Ki-21 was ready. Yeah. And one of the main complaints of the BR-20 uh, 20 was that it was a, a, a death trap. Like it, it gained that reputation of burning up. Yeah, yeah. Um, our, the, the other countries, like, uh, let's say, you know, UK, Britain, um, obviously, and the United States, they have military observers in Spain and in China. What are these guys sending back to, to their you know, country of origin, and are they telling people of the experiences with armor, if this is something that is worthwhile to look into? So I, I can only really speak for the U.S. They gave this reputation, but they're actually fairly late, com uh, relatively late comers to the concept of, of armor and, and fuel tank protection for their aircraft. However, once they decide to start going down that road, they adopt it with, with gusto. They, they really push it forward. But, um, you know, as it stood in, say, 1939, uh, all the principal combat aircraft of the U.S. Army Air Corps had no armor or fuel tank protection. Um, and the U.S. Navy was the same way. Um, you know, even fast forward to December 7th, 1941, the aircraft in Hawaii, it's kind of a, a, a mix. Some have, you know, okay protection, some have no protection, and then there's some that have fairly good protection. And that's, you know, all the way to up to the start of the war with Japan. So you, you, you kind of see that it's not quite as simple as it's often portrayed, at least for the for the U.S. I don't know what you can add for the British. In 1939, there is the first regulations that are um, kind of pushed forward to start adding some kind of armor to the Hurricanes and the Spitfires. The initial thing is to have this kind of armored windscreen. It's, it's kind of fitted right in front of the cockpit, so to protect the pilot from incoming fire from, from his front. Essentially, the thinking is that this is something that will help save his face in case he's attacking a bomber and there's defensive fire coming his way. Um, interestingly, between the Spitfire and the Hurricane, but this makes sense, the Hurricane is actually prioritized. And why is the Hurricane prioritized? Because the Hurricanes are in fact engaged in combat or in some sort of combat in 1949 and definitely in 1940 because they are deployed to France, whereas the Spitfire is kept back. So while this provision did pass and, and while, while the RAF is saying, right, we're, we're starting to going to add this kind of protection to both our fighters, the Hurricane is definitely prioritized. And it does take some time until these armored windscre uh, windscreens are actually added. Um, 
the Spitfires start getting them for um, the evacuation of Dunkirk. That's where we see the first Spitfires that have this kind of armor. But again, this is not standardized. This is this this stuff is sent out to the squadrons. Um, you know, here's a box of armored windscreens. Um, use them as you want, and then they start fitting them to some planes and some not. And actually, the pilots initially don't want protection. You know, Galant has this kind of funny story where he was uh, he was given this armored back rest for his head. And he turns around to his crew sheep, um, screaming at him, telling him, look, I can't see you to my, to my six now, what are you doing? And then in the next fight, uh, he is literally saved by that, uh, by, by that backplate. Uh, you also have the same story with a pilot from the RAF flying a Spitfire during the evacuation at Dunkirk, where you know he, he gets really, really angry that this thing piece is fitted because he says, like, it's too heavy, I can't see now, and so on. And then actually, you know, that plate takes two or three um, German MG15 bullets and it saves him. Um, do we see the same thing in, in Japan and the US? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, the US, from what I've seen, there was some skepticism. I mean, there, there's outright controversies of course the most famous being the f4 f4 mm. um which was much maligned when it initially entered service pilots were not happy at all with yeah. it because and, and it was more than just armor i mean uh they'd been adding some um improvised armor into the f4 f3 um boiler plates but yeah yeah but um they also increased the armament they basically added a whole bunch of weight to the plane and <laughs> The U.S. Navy pilots are like, what the hell are you doing? Hmm. Where um, one of them actually dismissed, it's hy hyperbolic, but you can kind of, uh, he, he described it as trying to fly a, TB, uh, um, a TBD with a torpedo. Now, of course, that's hyperbole, but you can see like how annoyed that they are, that they're, that people that, you know, in from their perspective, aren't on the front lines fighting, yeah. are shoving all this crap into the plane that's dropping the performance. Um, and again, with the Japanese, uh, you see it. Um, one specific example I can is there was one unit of uh, um, P forty eight, so actually light bombers, mm -hmm. um, which was which ended up actually being very heavily protected, except for there was some at least one unit that uh, they would remove all of the armor plate from the aircraft because they just they just thought it wasn't worth it. Wow. They just wanted okay. a little bit extra performance. But um, yeah, you'll see that all over the place. Um, the I know, I think particularly for the army uh, armor plates um, in their fighters, they were designed to be pretty easy to take in and out in the field. Yeah. So, of course, you'd have individual pilots or units that would say, no, no armor, or yes, I want the armor, or whatever. Now, with um, going back a little bit here to the RAF and the Luftwaffe during the Battle of Britain, because I think this is where we really start seeing a great shift and, and a great um, interest picking up in, in when it comes to armor. As I said, of course, the 109 doesn't have any kind of substantial armor until the E4 variant. It does not have any kind of self-stealing fuel tanks just yet. And one of the issues that the Germans have there is because the fuel tank for the 109 is actually designed to fit under the seat. It is sort of an L shape. Uh, it is pretty much it looks exactly like a, like a very comfortable kind of sofa. And this, this makes it a little bit hard to actually create a self-sealing contraption in that space with that shape. Um, now, I actually went to the National Archives in Kew here in London, and I, I went through some of the files they have there on armor protection, especially on the Spitfire. They have a lot of stuff there. And it's interesting how much effort, starting roughly in late 1940, where all these things are being added to the aircraft, um, how much interest it um, is uh, how much interest is given to this uh, aircraft protection. So we start seeing, uh, because for example, the RAF bombers didn't have any protection during that time either. And it started with um, a pilot, like kind of headrest for the pilot again, for the, and then for a seat, and then with armored bulkheads and also for protection of the engine. Uh, one of the tests I saw was with a Halifax. So they started firing, I think it was roughly 300 rounds of 7.92 millimeter um, Mauser into the engines and they used the starboard outer and the port inner engine and they realized that the starboard outer even though the the shape of the engine and the protection of that engine it's a i think it has six millimeter plate um is the starboard outer is a lot more susceptible to damage than the port inner and the report said well the reason why this is is because the inner engines have a housing for the gear 
and the gear absorbs all the shots going in, and it's not actually the armor that saves the engine because on the outer engine, that that one is gets shot to bits even by 7.92 millimeter rounds, um, which is kind of interesting. So th there's a lot of testing done here. What people often don't understand is that like even though people have been theorizing or even tinkering a little bit about it for you know 20 ish years. It's really in the very late 1930s into the war that this brand, this is a brand new technology hmm. with all of the, the, the um, experimentation and failure and, oh, well, you know, this didn't work. So we're going to go back to the drawing board and come up with something else. So initially, a lot of the time what you're seeing is uh, the RAF, um, you can probably actually describe their, their earliest um, attempts at protecting their fuel tanks better than I can. But it... So they start wrapping their fuel tanks in this thing called Linatex. And it is sort of, it is it's interesting Linatex, because on the one hand side, the RAF tells their own pilots that this stuff works. And what, you know, that, that this is going to allow their fuel tanks to sustain a couple of hits, and still, because the Linatex is kind of impregnated with rubber and so on, and it's going to swell up and it's going to fix those leaks. It doesn't work. Um, I mean, it works in some cases on, on to some degree, but it, it really it is really limited, let's say. But they tell their own pilot, Linatex works. The problem is only that in a lot of planes, they, they were designed without kind of this kind of protection in mind. So we have the Spitfire, who has two fuel tanks. One kind of sits flush right in front of the pilot in that fuselage, and actually on top of that, there's a three millimeter deflector plate. It's literally a deflector plate of an aluminum, aluminum there we go, alloy. And what that's meant to do is, is, is going to, incoming fire that kind of comes at you from straight ahead, again, from a bomber defensive fight, let's say, is gonna hit that alloy and it's gonna be deflected away. They, they know it, it's not going to be able to sustain damage coming in from a straight angle, but from this, these kind of very steep angles, it's gonna be deflected away. However, because this engine sits so flush inside the fuselage, they cannot make this tank self-sealing or wrap it in this kind of Linatex. The, uh, the tank below that can be uh, can be wrapped in it. And the same thing goes with the, the Hurricane. I think the one of the tanks, I can't remember, it was, was it the wings or was it the internal one, cannot be wrapped in, in, in this kind of stuff because it just doesn't fit. So actually picking up from what you said earlier about the um, American planes in the Pacific that have absolutely no standardization between them. So they are, you know, you have P-40s of different variants. You have the Bs, you have the Cs, you have the Es, all with kind of different um, armor and uh, fuel tank protections if they, if they actually do have it. Um, you also see the same with the Germans. There is initially absolutely no standardization between the, even the armor plates. So you have the bombers and the Ju-87s who have a different kind of armor composition uh, from the material that is being used. Um, so some of them have like a silicon manganese um, steel. Then there's the, those that have like a chromium steel and so on. So they, they, I think the RAF actually in the tests that they've done from all this you know, stuff that fell from the sky during the Battle of Britain found five different types of armor plating that the Germans used. And that kind of again shows you there is no standardization at this point. Um, what is actually interesting is that the RAF used a Heinke 111 bomber. Uh, it, it kind of you know, crash landed, but the, the, the shape of the bomber and the fuselage was still fine. And it fired 140 rounds into it, trying to see if it can penetrate the uh, crew compartment. Because there is this big 10 millimeter bulkhead between the actual fuselage and the crude compartment. And only 48 bullets from those 140 bullets that were fired actually hit the armor plating, which shows you that even though they had a direct shot, it was um, 10 degrees of stern, direct or stern, 20 degrees of stern, they knew where that plate was and they were specifically aiming for it. But the bullets piercing through the shell of the bomber and also you know any kind of equipment that might be in the way, they tumble, they get deformed, and so on and so forth, and they might actually not hit the armor pen, uh, armor protection. So with a roughly 30% of hits on that armor plating, only two managed to penetrate, and those were from 50 yards, maybe roughly 50 meters, direct astern, which shows you the kind of protection that is afforded by that armor plating. 
uh, especially considering that during the Battle of Britain, the uh, the RAF was only firing three or threes at this point in time. Obviously, eight per per uh, airplane, not just one. But the the um, the problem with the German bombers during that time is that the engines weren't armored. Not that they didn't have any kind of protection for the crew or the fuel tanks. However, now going into Japan, the great stereotype. There we go. Justin is already preparing himself with his. Uh, what is that? A naval uh, navy hat? Yeah, this is a IGN uh, officer's cap replica. There we go. Might as well embrace it. Um, so how how are things then in in Japan? Um, I'll I'll start asking you for the bombers. What's going on with the bombers? So um, like with any stereotype, there is truth to it. So. You know, I'm not going to be like, oh, well, actually, everything they had was amazingly well protected. Well, it's like, no, I, it, it, there's a truth to the stereotype, but it's more complicated than is often portrayed in mm. pretty much any book I've ever read. I'm going to pick out a couple of examples from um, the Navy, because I, I, I'll, I guess I'll quickly mention that there is a Japanese Navy Air Service and a Japanese Army Air Service. And they don't like um, each other. And they don't like <laughs> they don't like each other. Um, and they don't work together at all. They they share virtually no components. Uh, they they whatsoever. they couldn't even agree on the definition of what is a cannon, what is not a cannon. Like what kind of caliber <laughs> constitutes a cannon? The army, I think, says twenty millimeter. That's a cannon. The navy says forty millimeter, meaning that yeah, the, the, ar the army says twelve point seven or up. Is okay, a there we go. Yeah. Uh, the navy, all of them are are um, machine guns, because. The Navy's logic is it's a 30 millimeter. That's a that's a machine gun. That's like yeah. adorable. It's so makes, tiny. Makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> um, uh. But I guess I'll I'll I'll, I'll dig into a, a couple examples um, relatively deeply because they're the most famous. Uh, mm -hmm. That being the Navy's uh, G4M, which is the the land-based attack aircraft, their main bomber of the war, basically. So the Navy actually understood. Uh, a, like that their bombers were vulnerable from combat experience in China. When you read um, Japanese monographs compiled by officers post-war and uh, uh, historians have dug into like various reports during the war itself. And they're like, they're looking at casualties among their bomber uh, bomber forces, which are quite high initially. Um, and they're noting that like a lot of the time, um, at this time it's the G3M, it's the predecessor to the G4M. Right, yeah. Yet, of course, we know famously that the G4M was very vulnerable to catching fire. Well, it's because their logic was uh, went as follows. So, yes, okay, initially bomber losses were very high, but that's because there was no fighter escort. They were operating at low altitudes. There was. We've learned a lot since then, and once we started tweaking our tactics and started escorting our bombers, and bomber performance started to increase bomber losses dropped exponentially and they dropped to a level that the Japanese Navy deemed was acceptable. Now, of course, a lot of people now are thinking, well, okay, they can start seeing the flaws in this logic. Um, uh, the first massive loss of a G4M, uh, G4Ms uh, occurred in an unescorted low level attack against Lexington in February, 1942. Uh, 13 of 17 bombers were destroyed. And this is really one of the main areas where the Navy's logic began to fall to pieces because the G4M was actually designated as a land-based attack aircraft, not a medium bomber. And it's like, okay, well, who cares? Well, it means that in the Navy's mind, the G4M was a torpedo bomber first and a bomber second. So they would be conducting you know, G4Ms would be conducting attacks at low level against heavily defended targets, fleet targets. Therefore, suddenly your, you know, improved bomber performance is largely negated because they're, you know, 50 meters in altitude. It, you, you can't really hide from enemy fighters. Um, one of the main reasons why G4M losses were so horrific in the Guadalcanal campaign was the operational circumstances. They were operating at extreme range, um, but very importantly for bomber losses, uh, the Wildcats were able to consistently attack them from an altitude advantage, uh, which was really made possible by coast watchers. And of course, attacking from high, they would get what you know a plan form view of the aircraft when they were diving past uh, which was their yeah. preferred method of attack, and they'd get a beautiful shot at the wing fuel tanks. And 
all of this all of this kind of combined to create very high bomber losses for the G4M because the G4M depended on its performance and fighter escort so it could buzz in bomb buzz out with the fighters keeping other fighters away from it it wouldn't need to get shot at mid 1943 they introduced um kind of a, a sheet a thick sheet of uh, self-sealing material under on the underside of the wings in fact if uh, if you're very keen at looking if you ever get like an, a, a shot of the underside of a G4M and your G4M1 and you're trying to figure out maybe what area in production there's a, uh, it was uh, there's a few markers and one is you can very clearly see the um, self-sealing rubber sh uh, ply under the uh, wing tanks is, is there a reason why it was fitted only on the underside i mean i guess against uh, ground fire or, or against flak yeah so against uh, against fighters this would do absolutely nothing yeah so so what they what they looked at was in the guadalcanal like i said they would attack like this often yeah. the americans um and the japanese did tests and they found out that fires started in fuel tanks not so much when bullets entered the fuel tanks, but when they exited them. Oh. So when you're attacking from above, the bullets, of course, are passing through the wing and passing out the underside. So they were looking at that, and it actually proved effective in testing. They're like, well, when they do attack patterns like that, yeah. the, this kind of protection does actually work reasonably well. The problem is, of course, it's completely useless if you're attacked from basically any other angle. Yeah. So, so it's very marginal protection. Uh, they also added little five millimeter armor plates to the tail um, that were proved so useless in combat that it, it pretty, the first thing you got did when you got one of these G4Ms factory fresh is you took the five millimeter plates out of the tail. Is okay. is uh, my understanding? Uh, they just didn't like. They thought they were completely useless. How is it with the the army with the army bombers at this point? Uh, Army bombers, yes, this is what, where a, a major difference, because I kind of alluded earlier that mm -hmm. the army also noticed that they were having problems with fires in China. Yeah. So, But instead of the Navy's solution of, well, we're going to find tactical solutions and, and fighter escort to get around the fact that we need to protect our bombers, uh, you could almost say kind of wishful thinking. The army's like, okay, no, we need to start exploring protection features for the bombers themselves so from very early on from 38 the key 21 receives yeah. a very rudimentary field tank protection that's kind of their standard medium bomber and any subsequent uh the the design requirement for the key 49 um which would be the was the planned successor to the key 21 uh right in the design requirement it explicitly stated heavy armor and fuel tank protection explicitly in the design requirement and this is a japanese plane let's remember and they explicitly ask for protection just let's yeah, make that and, clear um, and uh, when you look at the key 49 at least by the key 49 2 which is a later model uh, I, i've seen like the i know you've seen it too the actual layout of the arm it's lavishly protected for a plane of its size um and also, knowing the reputation of the Key 49, it, uh, spoiler alert, it never really fully replaces the Key 21, and it's hated by Japanese Army pilots because it doesn't fly particularly well. They consider it underpowered. And it's like when you look at the amount of armor in it, oh. you can kind of start to see why. Um, it's like, what, is it like one armor plate that is like 16 millimeters or something? I mean, that must hold yeah, the record. It's, it's just ridiculous. They've got like yeah. bullets, they've got bullet resistance screens for the pilots they've got armored seats they've got panels all the way back they've got and it's like okay yeah, it's very impressively protected but it's like i can see yeah. why there were complaints that it was underpowered because because the thing must have just been ridiculously heavy oh yeah but anyway there's there's other uh, any other like their ground attack uh, aircraft that would enter service the key 51 it had armor protection uh the key 48 initially it had uh, rudimentary fuel tank protection and um, some armor protection which would steadily increase over time um even their fighters the key 43 one which is a kind of a notoriously uh vulnerable fighter and it, it had no armor protection initially and it's also exceptionally small and light um but it had rudimentary fuel tank protection uh, usually uh, started out initially as a three millimeter rubber sheath around a metal fuel tank. So again, yeah. very rudimentary, better than nothing, but not overly effective. And the Japanese would find that out very early and 
again, progressively, they would upgrade the, the fuel tank protection over time. Well, the interesting um, thing with the KI-43 is that eventually, and I've actually, in a, the previous video I've made on this topic, I used the KI-43 and I compared it to the American P-47 uh, Thunderbolt. And the KI-43, the later production models, have more protection inside of them and thicker armor plating of comparable strength um, than the P-47. But nobody mm -hmm. would ever say the P-47 doesn't hold this up against the fire as a Key 43. The Key 43 yeah. is, crashes yeah. and burns way before the, the, the Thunderbolt, um, which also shows you that armor protection and the protection that planes have isn't everything. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, if, if we transition maybe to, to the source, I think, of the, the great stereotype that we have of the Japanese, and that, I think, would be the A6M0 fighter. Yes. Um, because uh, the, the elephant in the room. Yes. At this time, so did most other fighters. Yes. The British and the Germans were transitioning. Of course, the the, the Soviets were ahead of the game by years. Um, the Americans, though, the pretty much ev at this point, pretty much everything's unprotected still. Yeah, it's very important. July 1940, the Zero gets introduced, and this is literally the month for the Germans start thinking about putting armor in their Emils, the 109 Emil. Um, yes, the 110 already has armor, and yes, the uh, RAF and their, um, starts thinking about it in 1949, but really, substantially, the armor starts rolling out right at the time when the Zero is implemented. And this makes the Zero, in the terms of its protection or its lack of protection, absolutely status quo. Yeah, it, 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 The planes that, that, that have armor are the, the exceptions here. Yeah. Um, you know, just as one example, uh, a very relevant example is the F4, F3 entered service with no armor or fuel tank protection. Uh, and retrofits would not be completed until after the start of the war with Japan. So we're talking really early 1942, they start trickling in, you know, there's improvised armor plate, there's yeah. retrofits to start upgrading some to self-sealing fuel tanks. But there are wildcats in the initial parts of the war that see action with absolutely no protection. Even though, of course, the stereotype is wildcat protection, zero no protection. It's, of course, a little bit more complicated than that. However, what makes the lack of protection in the zero unique is that the Navy refused to add protection features to the zero until really 1944, which, of course, is very late. And this is where you can see that, yes, it's a stereotype, but there's truth to it. Yeah. Because... I mean, they uh, have yeah, added yeah. some to the bombers. To, you alluded to it with the G4M. Um, they have. They probably know what the army is doing, which is probably another reason why they don't want to do it. But um, you know, the, the army fighters and the bombers have have sometimes lavishly protected aircraft, um, like you said with the Ki-49. Um, but well, like you said, the Zero is the exception in that. Not in, in that it didn't have any armor or protection when it came out of the factories initially, but that they never really implemented it until it was too late. Yeah, like uh, by 1944, they start to receive, um, usually I think it's like, a, if I remember right, a 13 millimeter backplate mm. and um, uh, armored windscreen yeah. and uh, automatic fire extinguishers for the fuel tank. So not self-sealing fuel tanks, but if the fuel tanks lit on fire, you could put the fire out one time. The Zero would eventually receive self-sealing fuel tanks. I, I can't tell you what model exactly because honestly, every source I read gives me a different answer. This is but very no usual. It's, it's, it's like, like this is normal in in late war Japan, late war Germany. You never know at what point any kind of modification was made because all those documents are either lost, sealed away, or you know are conflicting. It's it's absolutely normal. Well, I, I think this this transitions us nicely in, into um you know the, the the kind of binary argument that people make with armor and um, self sealing fuel tanks. Um, in, in that it's like, good is if you have it, bad is if you don't have it, but they don't actually look at what problems from a design perspective and then also from a performance specifically, armor has on an aircraft. Yeah, so like our armor protection, or our aircraft protection generally, it's typically discussed in overly simplistic binary terms. Because it's usually mentioned in a book that's not concerned with it overly. They just mention it in passing. Such and such plane had self-sealing fuel tanks and armor. Moving on. Yeah. I mean, even in some of my reference works, it's hard to, because they're not consistently 
they're not consistent with telling you what level of protection they have. Yeah, uh, it's one of those characteristics that even sometimes reference books look, overlook. I, I've seen people, Linda. you know, uh, with linear text, you know, with the wrapping around around the fuel tanks, calling that self sealing. It's not what I would call self sealing. You know, there's a certain amount of protection that maybe comes with linear text, uh, um, but it's not really self sealing. And if you look at the different kinds of self sealing fuel tanks that come out through the war and that are installed in the these aircrafts there's a lot of different models that offer different kind of protection and different kind of um well um they hold up differently under fire let's say um and 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 just saying oh this plane has self-sealing fuel tanks yes that is one way of explaining the kind of protection that it has but it doesn't give you the full picture the important thing to really stress is that in in 1940 41 42 Self-sealing fuel tanks, it's a constantly improving technology. It's not like we got self-sealing fuel tank problem solved. Um, so, you know, as one example, so in early 1942, the U.S. Navy, uh, the fuel, the self-sealing fuel tanks in the F-4, F-3s, uh, they began to leak. Um, and it was found that the gas, uh, gasoline with uh, high aromatic content used mm -hmm. by the, uh, the U.S. Navy was attacking the tanks. Uh, the linings contact the outer skin of the fuel tanks, leading to further deterioration. Uh, then swelling and bloating would occur, and it would threaten the integrity of the entire tank. And it took actually a considerable amount of engineering and, and downtime to fix it. Uh, for one example, the F-42 on Yorktown, um, April 10th, 1942, at least seven of its 19 F4, F3s were inoperable due to fuel tank problems. And for those of you that are more familiar with early carrier operations, one of the main complaints was we do not have enough fighters. We need more fighters. Yeah. So losing seven of 19 fighters on your carrier was like apocalyptic. This is just one example of, look, these, these nations were experimenting with a brand new technology, finding out something wasn't working and then going about fixing it. Yeah. And, and really, no one was uh, exempt from that. One of the things that I find interesting about this kind of armor protection is that pretty much every country, as they're going through this, develops the same, I wouldn't call it exactly the same protection level of protection, but very similar conception, conceptualizations. I mean, for the Luftwaffe, for the RAF and so on, the idea was always our, our armor plating has to withstand rifle caliber ammunition. Anything above that, it's it's not gonna work out just fine. Although I did, you know, refer to that one test that they did with twenty millimeter ammo, um, and the, the the Americans, I think they want to be resistant to fifty cal bullets, um, and they sort of get there. Um, but now, of course, I think if we expand this a little bit, um, the protection that an aircraft has is not just the armor plating, because bullets as they go through the superstructure. Of, uh, of a plane to foot of fuselage, they will start tumble, they will start deforming. Armor is a saving throw in that sense, I think. It, it's, it, if if um, you know, the crap has hit the wall and you really have no way of getting out of your situation, there is the armor and it will hopefully save you. It's one of those things that's hard to determine exactly because, of course, if the pilot ends up being killed, uh, you don't find out about it. It's just like somebody shot the plane down and they claim the plane. But sometimes when you get descriptions um, of, uh, for example, wildcats shooting up a, a zero, and they'll they'll say they shoot it up, they pull off, and they see the zero like it's not really smoking or anything like that, but it kind of jerks and then maybe just starts spiraling toward the sea, and that that could be a uh, evidence to suggest that quite possibly what they did was incapacitate or kill the pilot, and the plane itself might still be somewhat flyable, but it doesn't matter. Um, being an unprotected aircraft does not always mean that every time you get hit, you're going to burst into flames oh. or like crash. Um, and just like you know, protected aircraft aren't flying tanks that are like indestructible. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of counts of F4Fs and P40s and whatever going down in flames. And then there's plenty of accounts of Japanese aircraft, for example, returning from the attack on Pearl Harbor, where they've got dozens and dozens of bullet holes, including damage to their fuel tanks, and they didn't burn, and we were able to make it back to the carrier. So it's kind of degrees of protection, of course. You'd, you'd rather be in a protected aircraft getting shot up, but it doesn't mean that you're invulnerable. Yeah, the, the, I was going to so, uh, talk about you know, the price that you pay for armor protection and self-sealing fuel tanks. I think that's what we can round up. Um, I, I do want to make like kind of an honorable mention here. Um, IL twos, you know the the because people are going to talk about these Henschel one two nines, all these ground attack aircraft that has been specifically been armored to assist 
uh, their mission, which is to knock out tanks, fortifications. Um, you know, they, they they do a lot of close air support and so on. Um, that armor is significant. Again, it usually is in the realm of six to ten millimeters. Um, also, if you go into some of the bombers, like the B-17s, you know, the um, autopilot servos back in the tail, also a small box, I think it's four millimeters at that point, uh, armored, um, really doesn't do anything against a 20 millimeter bullet, but it's going to go do fairly well for against shrapnel or like a rifle caliber bullet. You have the bulkheads between um, the, the actual planes fuselage and the, the crew compartment, and you have another bull, uh, bulkhead uh, going to the, the bombardier and so on and so forth. Um, so there are specifically designed armor panels in all those planes there. And then you also have ad hoc protection like uh, Focke Wolf 190 A8 uh, Stormbox, the ones that were supposed to go into a bomber formation and just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot at, at specific bombers and not care about incoming fire. They have specifically armored panels added to the actual plane. Um, but there are prices you pay for this protection. We already talked a little bit about that performance and so on. Um, Maybe you have some specific examples there. Yeah, so one example, um, I'll go back to the G4M very briefly. And it's like, well, okay, well, why, if they, if the Navy recognized why, or that their planes were burning up in China, why not just put self sealing fuel tanks? And even if you change tactics and everything else, it's like, what do you give up, right? Well, they did the studies, and with the, the current design of the G4M1 with the double wing spar and the integral wing fuel tanks, they found out that if they just popped in a self-sealing fuel tank design that they had on, on hand, it would drop the range by 45%, which is for a naval bomber, that is like, I mean, for any plane, but I mean, particularly for one that you're going to be operating in the Pacific Ocean yeah. as a naval bomber, that was like, absolutely no. So um, the basic, what they said is, okay, well, we can't do it now. So the Navy's response was kind of like, well, we'll start doing like experiments with try to get like a really good self-sealing fuel tank at some point yeah. down the line. Um, it would take years before the G4M would finally receive self-sealing fuel tanks. So of course, by this point, uh, Japan was entirely on the defensive. So the extreme range was no longer necessary for sustaining their operations. Uh, and then when you, just as, as a rough numbers comparison, the G4M1 Model 11, that was the first production model, the maximum range, according to friends still, and I just pulled the numbers out, was uh, 3,256 nautical miles. Very impressive for a twin engine bomber. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the final production version, uh, the G4M3 Model 34, uh, it had a maximum range of 2,340 nautical miles. And this was with a significant redesign. They, they redesigned the wings, the everything. It, it was a, quite a different... Um, not a completely different plane, but they changed a lot. And it's still, you drop, you you lost immediately a thousand nautical miles of range. And, and this is uh, not just a thing with uh, with the G4Ms. I mean, every single plane that had, I alluded to it earlier as well with the 109, um, that had a redesigned uh, fuel tank, because it's not just like, okay, you have a fuel tank that's not self-sealing, and then you have a fuel tank that is self-sealing, and you're going to get the same kind of mileage out of it. It's not because the space that that fuel tank has to inhabit is still the same space, unless you completely change the structure of the wing where this, the fuel tank might be sitting, or the central fuselage. Um, I actually also have some figures, like with the P-39 uh, era Cobra, the... Um, the, the main fu uh, fuel tank had a hundred I what was it 170 gallons in it. Then they made it self-sealing, and it suddenly had 120 gallons. Uh, the B25 started out with 900 self-sealing. It suddenly drops to 700 gallons. Those is that is that is a price that nobody talks about when it comes to f fuel tanks. It's like oh yeah, self-sealing fuel tanks are important. Absolutely. And they added uh, uh, self-sealing fuel tanks into the F4 F3. The range already, uh, the already mediocre range dropped more. Um, it, it basically, it had about a 200 mile combat radius from the carrier, which is quite low for a, a carrier fighter. And a lack of range and or endurance was was a serious complaint with the F4F pretty much through its entire uh, life. Certainly before they added drop tanks because it didn't have them initially. Um, so they. It, it was really compounding problems. And of course, you're adding weight. So uh, eventually, you'd end up with about 135 pounds of pilot armor uh, behind the seat on the F4F, which, of course, had a, a, a pretty significant impact on performance, uh, particularly climb rate. You took, you again, you take a mediocre climb rate, and then you add a whole bunch more weight to the plane. 
and oh, it yeah. mediocre becomes bad. And the pilots were were quite angry about that, as I mentioned before. And also, there's like lots of little things that people would never even think of, including me, until I read it. Uh, for example, when they were retrofitting the F4, F3 with self-sealing fuel tanks, because again, initially it didn't have them, um, it completely screwed with the cockpit fuel gauges because, of course, you're changing the nature of the tank. So the pilots would have to manually careful uh, a total up the minutes that they had flown at various power settings to try and figure out how much fuel they had left, which, of course, really increases the workload of the pilot quite significantly and when you're talking about operating over the pacific ocean the last thing you want to to do is you know make a simple uh, uh, arithmetic error and end up out of fuel <laughs> yeah this is why you have to do your math when you're in school because when you fly an f4f in the pacific that those <laughs> skills might come in handy um there you go uh, if that doesn't um get you uh, studying i don't know what will so yeah, I, th I think we've kind of uh, touched uh, upon pretty much everything we went to s wanted to say. I mean, we have a whole bunch of notes here that uh, I'm sure people will will tell us about you know some of the things too we might have missed, which is fine. If you want to add to the discussion, that would be absolutely awesome. If you do have any kind of um, information on specific aircraft, if you've you know found some of the source material maybe in the archive, so if you had a, read a really good book, um, please tell us down below in the comment section as well. We're always interested in seeing where you know people draw the information from an ad to discussion and it would be awesome um we do have a couple of book recommendations i already i actually when when you were talking i turned around and pulled out a whole bunch of books that i have behind my seat and i was sh showing them into the camera um and specifically also uh lundstrom of course the, the recommendation that you gave um however there's one specific book i think that we should recommend here um that is uh was william dunn yeah or uh, richard dunn Richard Dunn, Richard Dunn, yeah. Um, it's uh, called Exploding Fuel Tanks, right? A very, a very uh, appropriately named book, I yes. guess. I was, uh, um, I was carrying it around, and um, that title would really grab people's attention for some reason. <laughs> yeah. So Richard Dunn, Exploding Fuel Tanks, is a um, hands-down recommendation from from my part and also from Justin. Um, there's one book that I would also recommend. I think it's called uh, Anthony Williams, um, Flying Guns of World War II. He goes into the aircraft guns, um, which is, I think, something that would also be interesting for you to, to look into. Um, you know, if you take Richard Dunn's book about defensive measures and then you take uh, William's book about um, the offensive measures, you can kind of get a really cool picture there of how things are. And uh, specifically, of course, for the Pacific, um, there's four recommendations that I've... Um, Put on screen and i'll also have them of course as with every video in the in the description below where we pull our sources from anyway justin thank you very much for uh, for um for having a chat on this topic um, i'm sure we'll both uh, will watch the uh, comment section with great interest and um hopefully you guys enjoyed it as well as always um please do check out also our patreon it is the support from guys like you that uh, make this channel uh the wheels of this channel go round and round and round um, and if you did enjoy this video, please like and share it with your friends. And as always, we wish you a great day, good hunting, and see you in the sky.